Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, first meeting as president, so hopefully I won't botch it too much. Um, first announcement is we're not going to have a December meeting. Uh, Judge Lano is not going to be here on that Thursday, and with all the holiday luncheons and whatnot, we figured we'd give everybody a break. Um, as you know, there are some uh, amendments to the federal bankruptcy rules that are going to be uh, starting effective December 1st. We're going to post a link to those on our website, but you all should have gotten the email from uh, um, from one of the court clerks. You know, I got the one I received was from the Northern District. That was very informative. Um, I can forward that to anybody that wants it. Uh, if you just say the word, I'll forward it to you. Um, rather than go line by line, you can read those yourselves. Um, this morning we have a, a presentation by um, Maxwell Henry and Simmons. Uh, real estate appraisers and consultants. They are here to talk to us about the use of expert witnesses in valuation trials. Um, and I know that these gentlemen have uh, served as witnesses in a lot of trials in Lee County, Collier County, um, in you know, commercial and residential uh, cases. They asked that I not do their bios, <laughs> so I'm not going to. Um, but uh, we'll I'll just, yeah. <laughs> um, but we have Gerald Hendry, um, Mike Maxwell and Matthew Simmons, uh, who make up Maxwell, Henry, and Simmons, uh, surprisingly enough. So with that, I will let them uh, take the podium and present their, uh, their CLE today. Oh, and here is Judge Delano. Judge, do you want to, uh, anything you want to say to the group before the CLE, um, or do you want to wait for I can do it afterwards, that's okay. fine. Okay. Um, and there is CLE credit for this, everybody, so I have the forms up here but you're not allowed to have one of these until after the presentation. Um, so with that, I'll give the floor to Gerald. Very good, thank you, Paul. Appreciate uh, you all giving us the opportunity here to speak to you. I know it's gonna be exciting to get to talk to real estate appraisers and have a chance to do today. It goes great. But no, hopefully we can uh, provide some insight more from, from our eyes as the witness. We recognize that you guys are the legal professionals. We're not here uh, you know, as the experts in the legal profession, but more from, from our perspective as, as expert witnesses. So um, what we'd like to do is encourage you all to interject any comments you have, questions you have uh, throughout this. It would, really would go a lot smoother if, <coughs> if we had some input from you all. Um, so feel free at any time to give any comments, questions, or if you just get tired of hearing us talk and want to interject. So um, just a little bit about us. Maxwell, Henry, and Simmons, we're a full service real estate appraisal company. Uh, we've been in Lee County since the early 1980s. Uh, what's a little bit unique about our company, uh, we do both residential and commercial, but we also do general practitioner work, the work you would see for a bank loan or, or a mortgage type loan. Uh, but we also do a lot of litigation support work, eminent domain type work, expert witness type work. So we feel that we have a pretty good balance there. You know, we're not just general practitioners who occasionally get thrown into the courtroom, and we're not your continual expert witness who really doesn't have the boots on the ground on, on a daily basis. We do a little bit of both, so we feel um, it kind of sets us apart a little bit from, from the rest of, of the crowd. Um, a little bit about uh, each of us. I'm Gerald Hendry. I've been in the real estate appraisal business here in Southwest Florida for over 20 years. Um, I do commercial work primarily. Um, I have an MAI designation, CCIM designation, and have testified circuit court and bankruptcy and uh, served as expert witness dozens of times. So um, Mike Maxwell here is our founding partner. And Mike uh, has been in the business a long time. A long time. Long time here in the 1970s. Most of it here in Lee County. Um, Mike uh, right now is primarily doing litigation type work. However, he also does general type work as well. Um, and he primarily is on, a, on the residential side. Mike has a MAI designation and an SRA, des SRA designation. And Matt Simmons, um, he's one of the partners in our firm as well. Matt primarily focuses on the residential side of our business. Not to say he can't do the commercial side, but that's his specialty. Um, he does a lot of high-end residential uh, type appraisals. What's a little unique about Matt is a couple years ago, he was the youngest appointee to the Florida Real Estate Appraisal Board. 
And for those of you who don't know what that is, probably none of you know what that is, but that is the license, licensing authority for all appraisers in the state of Florida. So the, we call it free app, the acronym for that. Um, they provide the standards for all appraisers in the state of Florida, disciplinary action for all appraisers in the state of Florida. And Matt is now the chairman of free app. So he's the, he's the big kahuna for, for real estate appraisers in the state of Florida. So our agenda today, we're going to hopefully not bore you too much with, with appraisal information, but um, we're, we're going to, Matt and I are going to give you kind of a quick two to five minute overview of the commercial and residential markets. We thought that was pertinent to what you all do. Maybe it'll help you with your clients in making a decision on how to move forward with the case. Um, following that, Mike's going to give us a little presentation on choosing a, an expert witness, things to look for. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about Daubert and some other fun, fun items that uh, deal with admissibility of, of witness uh, information. Um, and Matt's going to come back and talk a little bit about appraisal regulations and really some tips on how you all can use what we call our standards, the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, how you can use that to your benefit um, in dealing with expert witnesses, whether they're your witness or maybe in cross-examination. So I thought I'd start off, we have a little video uh, here. This is a friend of ours. Uh, we haven't seen him in a while, but it kind of gives a, a depiction of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, that said, we'll, we'll start with that. Yo, Vic. You don't return Johnny's phone calls. What did you say? Oh, no. I'm only the appraiser. Well, let me appraise you this. Be at the Red Chimney on Route 3. 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, ready to go to work for Johnny and Carmine. Vic is scared now. Nobody knows where he is. Look, it's a bluff. They don't really want to start a separate operation. You know the costs that are involved in our kind of a HUD scam? You got the appraiser, the poverty pit. They want in on a going thing. You want me to pay a visit to Johnny Sachs, guys? Just say the word. I'm only the appraiser! <laughs> What do you think, you could hide from us? Tony bought three more houses than the appraisals, Victor. I can't. I told you, please. Johnny and Carmine's guys, they hurt me. That's nothing compared to what we're going to do, Victor. So go back inside, get your praise and shit, and start appraising. Hopefully you guys enjoy that. <laughs> we, uh, we do this. We, we teach a... Uh, uh, introduction to valuation class um, out at FGCU uh, every year, and we always show this to the students out there. They always get a kick out of that. But um, we don't usually have that much pressure, but I, I do find that we have pressure in our business, and um, that's a little exaggerated, obviously. But uh, always a fun video to start with. And I don't know if Vic was an expert witness, but I think he got, he's somewhere in the witness, maybe witness protection part of that. I, I don't know. But anyhow, a lot of fun there. Um, we're just going to go real quick through what's going on in the commercial market, and then we'll get into the kind of the heart of, of uh, our presentation. Um, you all know what happened during this recession. <laughs> 2005, the residential market started to decline significantly. 2006, 2007, um, our commercial market started to decline. And it's kind of hard to see here, but our, our chart starts on 2007. The red is our retail market. Sale price per square foot. The uh, green is our office market. The blue is our industrial market. You can see the significant decline there, 2007, 2008, 2009. And right around 2011 to 2012, we started to flatten out. And what, what's promising is are these little upticks here. So we're starting to see not, not significant growth, in values, but we are starting to see things happening, and these are these are some promising items. Now, these are lease rates here, same same colors. Starting to see a little uptick in retail 
rents, a little uptick in office rent, warehouse rents are relatively stable. Um, but all, all pretty positive signs for our market. Um, vacancy rates, our biggest vacancy is, is the top line here. That was our office market. We were upwards to 31% in all of Lee County um, back in 2009. And even somewhere along 2013, we we're still at 26%. Uh, but we're, you can see the, the trend there. Um, and, and our office, or I'm sorry, our retail and our industrial market has kind of, in terms of vacancy, has started to flat, flatten out a little bit. But overall, we are seeing some, some nice, slow improvements in the market. And um, Matt's going to talk a little bit about, I think that's all I have for. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the residential market. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, good morning, or afternoon at this point, everyone. Uh, I just want to touch briefly on the residential market, and I wanted to show you um, kind of graphically what we've seen happen residentially and part of what the problem has been here uh, and the issues we ran into. Each of those red dots reflects a rooftop that earned a certificate of occupancy in that given year. So okay, this isn't all homes that were obviously built in Lee County in 1970. These are just homes that were completed in Lee County for the year 1970. And I'm gonna move through here at a 10 year clip just so that you can see visually what happened here and part of what our problem is, and I'm sure part of what created a significant amount of work for you all over the past several years. So it's 1970. Okay, a lot of clustered growth around uh, the river. 1980, we start to see the emergence of some areas down south and over in Cape Coral. 1990, okay, the area is still clearly expanding and growing. Good news, but it's pretty well spread out. 2000 whole lot going on now. We've got areas of southwest Cape Coral that are starting to, I feel like I'm giving the weather forecast a bit. We've got areas of southwest Cape Coral that are really starting to emerge, but we can tell we've still got a pretty even pattern of growth. So we're going to now go from 2000 into five-year increments. Now check this out. 2005, okay? I'm sure a great number of folks in the room here have dealt with many of these red dots, okay? There's 2005. Look at Lehigh and Cape Coral, particularly North Cape Coral, okay? 2010. Now, how underdeveloped were we then? Okay, but you can still see some pockets of growth starting to pop up. Now, check out 2013. Still pretty low, but there's a, there's a, enough coming on here that we can see there is a small uh, area of growth from 2010 to 2013. Obviously, in the next month or so, we'll gather 2014 and see how that looks. I think we're going to see another small increase, but a reasonable one. Here's a, a graphic presentation of what you just saw, okay? New rooftops over the past 45 years. So that's 1970, 1980, 90, 2000, 2005. That's just shy of 14,000 new rooftops, okay? 2010, 1,283. And then into 2013, we're back up to 2,164. So just a little bit there to provide some context for part of what our problem was. I uh, got a quick graph I wanted to show you. These are for four kind of benchmark residential markets, Cape Coral, Lehigh Acres, Golden Gate Estates, and San Carlos. Don't worry about being able to see the fine print. That's not the point anyway. What I wanted to demonstrate is that while Gerald mentioned that we're now starting to see on the commercial side an increase in values, we've seen that now for two, three years running on the residential end, some pretty substantial increases in the residential market. Now particularly over the past six to eight months, we're starting to see that rate of increase tail off a bit. Whereas we had years of double digit price growth, we're now starting to look at something that would have an annualized rate between maybe six and 8% of a median increase. Is that still pretty good though? That's wonderful. If we could clock six to eight years, I think anyone would be happy to settle for that. It's much more healthy. The other uh, new element here, new inventory is coming quickly. Uh, I mean, most, most everyone realizes that. You can see the rooftops going up. But if uh, you work on the development end and you know the number of finished lots that are coming as well, there's some folks even on the land side who deal with raw land who've expressed a little bit of concern with how many new finished lots we're going to be bringing to market. So touch of, touch of concern that things could be getting a little bit overheated even already. And then the final item residentially to be worried about, concerned with, uh, the impact of interest rates. They can't stay at what they're at now for long. Something to keep an eye on, uh, something that, that is a little bit concerning on the residential end. People now buy homes the way that they've started buying cars, not what's the price, what's my payment. 
okay? That's dangerous for a market when it's so dependent on artificial interest rates. So something to just kind of keep in mind. I'll turn over the presentation now to Mike Maxwell. And we have uh, impact fees coming back as well, do we not? So that's going to have some impact as well. So, um, well, my presentation is going to be without a lot of graphs and charts and numbers. It's really going to be just basically how you might select a, an appraiser. Uh, I'm also going to break this down into working with the appraiser and then finally we're going to talk a little bit about um, the litigation phase and some things you might consider and how, how you would work and how we would work with you, how we would work together as a team. Um, most of this stuff is you know, very, very simple, it's very obvious. Uh, we just put this together as uh, uh, the acronym FACTS uh, when selecting an appraiser. There's a lot of us around um, and you want to obviously select uh, someone, consider someone who is, is, is obviously going to be factually uh, detailed, very forensic, and very precise at what they do. Um, you know, these days of having data, when I started the business in business in 1974, your data, your information that you had was very proprietary, you worked hard to get it, you didn't want to release it, and that was, that, those were your jewels. Everybody now has got these, these little jewels. Everyone has the information. Anyone with a computer can go and gather data and information. We have all kinds of sources today uh, that is providing us. So it's not uh, uh, enough just to have the information, to have the data, but it's important to be able to, to analyze that data, to know what to do with that data. And I think that's probably the most critical thing. So obviously you want someone who's going to be uh, very thorough, forensic, accurate, detailed, and can handle that kind of stuff and knows how to handle that. Um, a, articulate. Uh, particularly if you're going to be dealing in um, a court, obviously you're going to need to have someone who is reasonably good on their feet, can communicate uh, with the trier of fact, uh, whether that be a judge, whether that be a jury. Uh, to be able to communicate well is important. Communicate in two different ways. We communicate obviously uh, on paper with our reports, and then we do so verbally. I was many, many years ago, early on, asked what what I thought was the most important uh, criteria in, in becoming an appraiser, and I said, well, you know, obviously factually oriented and analytical and all of that sort of stuff is good and reasonably good with math, but I think being articulate and being able to compose and write and communicate is very critical because at the end of the day what you end up with is an appraisal report a document and someone has to be able to read that and understand that and has to make sense or to your standing up in front of a group of people in front of a jury or, or a judge and you're having to explain what it was uh, you know, that you have done and how you analyzed it. So being reasonably accurate uh, or excuse me, articulate of course being able to communicate is important C, competent, kind of a little bit of a repeat at first, but really someone who is well credentialed, somebody who has some real world experience. Um, you see in our firm kind of a range of ages. You have, I'm now the old guy, I'm 62 years old, but I'm officially old. And, and I just want to compare it to, to Matt, I probably am, and I have a, we have a lot of fun in the office because they think of me as the old guy. Uh, I don't know if I like that or not, but uh, there's some, uh, there's some, a lot of benefit that I think bring, or that, that we would bring as a firm. Uh, I'm not advertising here, I'm just saying what I love about our firm is that we do have that breadth of experience and this generation, these differences in generation. Gerald's in the middle of the pack somewhere there. But, uh, so I think that's important. I think that the maturity, the, the number of years, the experience obviously is certainly uh, uh, important. But it's not just an age factor, uh, because obviously uh, that cuts uh, both ways. I've seen people that are 100 and you wouldn't want them on the stand, or someone that's 30 and you wouldn't want them on the stand. So that's obviously not just the uh, number of uh, years or age. Court experience, of course, is very critical, particularly if you're dealing with something that might end up in court. You want to have someone that's got some experience. Pretty obvious. Uh, I mean, somebody has to, we all start somewhere, you got to have your first case. So uh, sometimes, you know, that, that's going to occur. But if you're dealing with something complex, obviously you're going to want someone who's got some experience uh, in the court. Um, 
the designation is obviously critical, I think, the uh, MAI designation, both the two of us uh, hold that currently. Um, have another young fellow in our office about ready to get his MAI, that's critical, and I think the courts look to that quite a bit. Uh, clients look to that, they always have. Um, these days with the licensing changing over the years, um, there's argument as to whether how important that is, but I, I think it sets apart someone uh, from the field if they've gone to the difficulty and the trouble and the years of getting the experience and taking the courses and writing the demos and all that sort of thing to uh, to get the designation. So I think that's critical and I think uh, most people would agree with that. Um, I would question someone as to distant point of problems, any issues there. There's some things you can certainly check. Matt will talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but obviously you want someone who uh, doesn't have those kind of problems and uh, has a good track record on that as well. Up to date, continue net, of course, is important, uh, licensing and so on and so forth. Um, T, trustworthy. Um, pretty well speaks for itself, but I mean, we, we're, we're not an advocate. Um, we're an advocate for our value, and we'll fight to the death for what we did. But where we differ from the legal profession is you guys are advocates. Um, we have to call it like we see it. So sometimes there's a little bit of a you know, rub in there, and we, but we have to be calm it like we see it, and we have to be obviously trustworthy uh, in terms of, of um, what we do, unbiased, I think it's really we're talking about a bias issue here and that's very critical that we uh, do not lose uh, that as, as our uh, primary uh, characteristic because we are being called in to render an unbiased opinion of value and that's what we have to do and sometimes that, that, sometimes that uh, upsets our client or uh, the attorney but that's what we have to do. Um, S for support. Um, particularly in larger cases, we're going to be working with a team. Uh, we've worked in some very, very large cases here in years, uh, recent years, where we're just one cog in a wheel. We've got a planner, we've got an engineer, we have an economist, we have an environmental person, we have this, we have that. Uh, particularly, I work a lot in or have in uh, eminent domain. And when there's a taking, uh, there's usually other witnesses involved in the case that are that try to help establish the predicate, the proper way to value the property. Um, trying to be this uh, uh, deluded witness and going out and thinking you know everything and just doing the appraisal and then you've got all these other issues that come into play can be a very dangerous thing. So we have to be very careful when we work uh, in a case and we have other experts, um, we have to be able to work with them to understand what they do and how their uh, particular specialty works in the case. Um, there are, are some cases, there have been several, frankly, where the land planner, uh, the, the engineer, uh, environmentalist will set the predicate that this is what you can do with the property. It's their opinion based on their knowledge of and understanding of zoning and land use that you can do this, this, and this with it. And based on that, we do the appraisal. And that's helpful to us, obviously, uh, since we don't have to deal with that. Uh, we've got another expert who knows what the zone and what the lane and all those sort of things are going to be. So enough on that, though, just to let you know that you know we deal quite a bit with uh, a team approach. And it's important to be able to pick someone, select somebody who will be able to work as a team member. Um, so the Working with the appraiser, I said I've got this in kind of three stages. One is the selection of the appraiser, now you're working with the appraiser, you've selected them. We have, uh, first bullet point here, fact versus an expert witness. You know, we, what are we? If, we? if it's something we did a year ago and you just, you know, you're going to call us in and just, and we're a fact witness only, um, there's not much we're going to be able to do, but though, that's it, that's what we did. I don't think we're obligated to do really very much more than that if we are a fact witness. It's rare that we're called into court as a fact witness. Usually they want us there to be an expert witness. They want to know why we did what we did, or they needed updated or anything, such like that. But sometimes we're just a fact witness, and, and that's, that's okay. But 
nine out of ten times we're going to be called in as, a, as an expert witness, which is a whole different uh, matter. Uh, there should be, there always is, uh, particularly in the legal uh, arena, going to be an engagement letter, an engagement agreement. Um, know that, uh, and that's that's a fairly detailed, you know, about an eight or ten page in our firm document that tells us what everyone's going to do, what our scope of services are, who's responsible for payment, who the client is, all kinds of little details about that. Um, I want to mention at this point, though, that when you hire uh, a firm, you don't have to, uh, as they say, buy a pig and a poke. You don't know what you're going to get. So you can engage the appraiser to do a phased assignment. You know, tell me what you're going to get. What, what's your value going to be? Do this amount of work and give us a you know, flavor of where you're going to be. If that works into your uh, plan, we can follow up then with the final written report. We don't always have to do the full soup to nuts uh, appraisal. So an engagement letter can be structured to where you can uh, have phase one, maybe a, a value development of the value, and then phase two would be the report development, the actual document itself. Uh, we're, we are, do, we do that quite a bit. We're allowed to do that. There's nothing inappropriate, unethical, illegal, immoral, whatever about doing that. And I understand that. If people want to know what is it we're getting, you know, the old days it was go do it, you did it, here it is. Oh, what's that? You know, and then, so now, now we work with the attorney a little bit more, and it's uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit uh, more helpful. Kind of already touched on the guarding against bias. I think that's uh, not prejudging a case, getting all the facts first. Um, you know, we all come to the table with some amount of bias. We try not to do that. When we we have a lot of history, and knowledge, of experiences with values and properties over the many years we've been doing this. Myself, 40 years now. So you have to you have to guard against the bias. You have to look at each and every case as a fresh and new start. And, you have to approach it that way and not let yourself be uh, influenced in that regard. Um, keeping everyone informed of deadlines, uh, particularly as it involves litigation, uh, depots, report production, report exchange, the trial, um, case management, I'll just call it. It's, it has been my experience to work with some very, very good attorneys and in some cases some not as good and some People's their style is here, do the appraisal, and you know, you might hear back from them, you might not. I've had others that want to know every day nearly what it is you're doing and how you're coming along and what your value is going to be, and so on. I actually prefer the latter, uh, or, or at least in between, but I prefer the latter if I had to choose one or the other. I don't like to be turned loose and then, uh, then suddenly, oh, there's a deposition next week. You know, we, we need to and want to be informed along the way of everything that's going on so that we can make sure that we fit that into our deadline, into our schedule, and work uh, with with everyone. And again, there may be other witnesses uh, as, as well. Um, the communication, this is kind of part of it uh, throughout the report. Um, you know, regular meetings, regular communication with the client as to what's going on is very critical. Uh, those days, of just doing it, turning it into I think are gone. I think it's important that we communicate and meet regularly so that the team knows, everybody knows what's going on. So when you get up to the deposition or to the trial, there's no, there's nothing that's uh, hasn't been turned over. Everybody knows what's going on. So that's kind of working uh, with the appraiser. Uh, just some thoughts we had uh, on that. Um, if it goes to the litigation phase. Um, there you go. We start with maybe, and not in any particular order, but these are just some thoughts again that we had. Uh, deposition. That's usually the first, uh, you know, we know it's going to trial. We know usually ahead of trial there's going to be a deposition or two or more. And uh, it's important with uh, the attorney to work with them to know what, you know, what, uh, what we need to be prepared for. I'm going to throw something out and we can talk about this a little later. It's going to come up, and that is what I call the file. What is the file? What's discoverable? Um, it's, there's a lot of interesting uh, thought on that, um, you know, as to what, what constitutes the file. Um, I've heard different things about that. Um, you know, what's discoverable? Uh, communications with the attorney, discoverable. Um, 
meeting notes with the attorney or the client. Um, there's stuff like that, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking out here because I'm, I'm really going out on a limb because I'm, I'm clearly into your area uh, as to what uh, is or isn't discoverable and what constitutes a file. So uh, we're going we're gonna, to, I think, come up to that and maybe have a little interesting uh, conversation about that. Um, preparing the appraiser, uh, knowing exactly what we're going to say if we get on, on the stand. That's important. Want to know what you want to know what we're going to say, and I kind of like to know what you're going to ask. So you know, we do spend a great deal of time on the direct side. That's the easy part of the equation, of course. Is you know the friendly fire, the friendly part of it is knowing what you're going to ask, and I know what I'm going to say. Uh, it always gets, of course, interesting after that. Uh, some things like exhibits, who prepares them. Everyone now is going to the PowerPoint. It used to be in the old days, put in these big boards and all this nonsense and of course now it's usually all done PowerPoint or there's an exhibit packet things like that which is done. Uh, is this a bench or is this a, a jury trial? Um, who's the trier of fact? Is it, does it matter? And, uh, you know sometimes we present things uh, differently maybe. Uh, we have just a, uh, you know, the, the judge. If we're dealing with 12 people um, that's different. You, you will be asking different kinds of questions and be probably hand feeding things a little differently because there are 12 people that probably don't know too much about what you do or the process. So that's obviously a whole lot different. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned again, I already mentioned this, working in conjunction uh, with, with, other, with other experts. That's uh, very critical. Um, when you get into the final finish line and you're working on a trial, it's, it's, it's really interesting as you well know and making sure that uh, I as the appraiser know how I fit into the process and I'm not doing anything that's conflicting with the other witnesses just make sure everyone's on board on this and it's very very critical so also getting ready for the other appraiser on the other side that's really good absolutely we find that we will be helping in the system returning on cross-examination you know, once we've done our job uh, we no doubt getting the, the other side of uh, you know, their view of what they think the property might be worth or another, or another appraisal report. And so you can use the appraiser in assisting you with cross-examination and, and uh, you know, confirmation of data and all those sorts of things are where we can really, I think, be helpful in the case and assist you on that. And Because that's all we do. I mean, there are some things that we will see and understand as appraisers that we can kind of help you form some of your questions to be looking for what to be asking. So that is pretty much what I have on my section. Any we'll say questions we get longer. Thank you. All right, I'm going to speed my section along because I think Matt has some things that more answers from you all. I want to hear some work file. I want to kind of hear what you guys have to say because I think it, it's really pertinent to what we do. Uh, what I was going to talk about is the role of an appraiser as an expert witness. I'm going to go through this a little bit faster than I would have. Um, why do we need an appraiser? Why do we need a, a, that third party? You know, it's a pretty obvious question, but I'll give you a, a, an example here. So Richard Johnston's got a case, and he's coming as a, representing his debtor. And <laughs> the debtor has, you know, lovely house with you know, obviously some root problems and the washer and dryer probably doesn't work too well and he wants he's trying to do a lean strip so you know this is this is how he's portraying that that property and, and Paul over there is on the other side and he's working with the creditor and same house but you know that's how that's how Paul sees it so that's why that's the obvious that's why we need need the appraiser and then I come along and you know that's kind of what you get but the roof is better than, than Richard so maybe it's somewhere in between those two and since it's tax season here's how the property appraiser or the yeah, yeah the tax collector might see your property so, <laughs> so really our, our role is and a lot of this tails on into what Mike was saying we are here to be unbiased impartial objective um, we never want to be the appraiser that goes out, or the expert that goes out on a limb that uh, takes extremes. It might work for, for you all in a specific case, but 
over time, you're, I think the triers of fact understand who the extremists are in every situation. And so when you're hiring an, an expert, look out for the ones that are, are steady, that don't go to extremes. Um, because ultimately, the second item there, that's what we're all about. If we don't have credibility as experts, as appraisers, the, your case is probably shot. Our career is probably shot. So we live and die by credibility. Um, and, and also, cases change, as you all know, over time. And if you took a stance as an appraiser at the beginning of the case, and the case changed, and maybe you changed with it, how does that look? It doesn't look good at all. So that's why we um, need to stay steady. And last, we don't ever want to be a, whatever that word is there. You know, we don't want that person to come along and say, oh, there's Mike Maxwell. He's such a, or, or there's, there's Matt Simmons. Boy, he's, he's one of those A. I'm talking about advocate. We don't want to be advocates. So that's, we don't ever want to become an advocate, advocate for, we want to become an advocate, like Mike said, for our appraisal, but not an advocate for your case. So, um, case law, just real quick. I know I want to get mad up here real quick. Um, why is case law important to us? We, we really, in a case, we really need you all to share with us what case law may be relevant. We're not the legal experts, as we talked about earlier. You guys are the legal experts. And there, it may be something as simple as, what date do we value a property for your case? What's the relevant case law for that? We need to know that. Um, there could be many factors. I, I was just recently in a uh, seminar about ec being an expert witness, and this, it was a case in California, George Hale. Um, it was a, about a house. They were doing a lien strip, and the appraisers had completely different dates of value. As long as we were, the, the key points were, were you qualified and your methodology. And as long as we're doing the correct methodology in, what, in our appraisals, it doesn't really seem to impact what we do. Now, um, for you all on the other side, if you're, if, if you're cross-examining somebody or if you have a, a case, it, it, it might be something to look at. And, and definitely, in hiring your expert witness, make sure that they're aware of what's out there. Well, and defending your methodology, too. Defending That's a key point in your testimony. Right. Being able to support, and, and I'll touch on a little bit, in this day and age, with technology, we have so much information out there. So we should be able to support what we do, any adjustments to our sales or whatever. We should be able to, to do that. Um, not on every property, but for the most part. Um, I'm going to go through real quick. Um, speaking of methodology, these are our standard methodologies for how we appraise a property. We have a cost approach, a sales comparison, and an, and an income approach. Cost approach, very simple. You take the cost of a building, any indirect cost surveys, appraisals, etc. Take away depreciation, add the land. That's one form of a value. Sales comparison approach is probably what you all recognize in a house appraisal. Substituting substitute properties. What did the house up the road sell for? What did the building up the road sell for? And we adjust from there. Um, income approach would be more. Um, on the commercial side, for the most part, um, for, for a potential income producing property, we start with what could the property potentially um, generate an income minus any potential vacancy, minus expenses, gives you a net income, and you capitalize that into a value. Those are basically our, our three, our big three in terms of methodology. Now, there are times when we have to divert from that if we have a very complex property. There might be other um, parts of these big three that we need to, to consider. Um, the challenges we always have are that real estate is an imperfect market. So it's hard to it's hard to find exact information and scientifically prove everything. And that kind of goes back to Dahlberg, which was talks a lot about scientifically proving things. So that, that's where we struggle. Art and science, we, we're always taught that Appraisal is a little bit of art, a little bit of science. It's leaning more towards science as we get as technology grows. Um, 
I'll, I'll kind of skip these for now. These are just some more more scrutiny that we're seeing um, on the Florida level. I know Daubert was adopted about a year or so ago. Um, I've heard a lot of buzz about it. Haven't really seen anything different than what we've been doing um, over the years. Um, federal rules of evidence. This is always a good thing, Richard. Kind of update the quantum. He brought this to my attention in the case we were we were doing it. I think it's always good to let your experts know about federal rules of evidence, you know, 702, how it relates to the appraiser. Um, and the key fact that I found was, you know, requires opinions based on sufficient facts and data rather than the old school, hey, it's my opinion. There's enough information out there now that, that maybe you don't need to do that. Um, source your information. Um, I'll give you a quick example. And this is somewhat an actual case, but I changed the numbers. Um, I showed you a cost approach earlier. Appraiser one, we both thought the, the reproduction cost was a million dollars. We both thought the land was about $100,000. But you'll see there was one item, our depreciation, the denominator there. I thought that, and the, what that is, 30 years is effectively how old the property is. 40 years is um, how long, what's the useful life of the property. I thought the building was, was 30, they thought it was 30 effectively, but we, we differed in the 40 and 50 years. Um, and you can see the, the big difference there. So what if, your, what if your loan amount was somewhere in the middle? You, were, you, know, you really want to be able to fight that 40 and 50. And the case I was in, we, we, were, we were ready to fight the 40. We didn't have to, but we sourced our information. Going back to that federal rules of evidence, we really sourced it. We were ready to go, and I don't think the other side was ready for it. Luckily, we didn't have to use it anyway. So, um, I'm just going to turn it over to you because we're okay. short on time. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Gerald. Um, I just want to jump in. That case that you and I had a couple years ago. Yes. Use an appraiser that knows the river the district is near the river. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get on. Yeah. Use an appraiser that knows the market because we had the other side use an appraiser from, I think it was Miami. From Miami, right. And they had no idea what the river district was or basically how downtown Fort Myers was set up. And they were appraising waterfront hotels to give the value on a uh, apartment complex in the ghetto. Yeah. And the other thing is use an appraiser that has a report that follows Dalbert and makes your job a lot easier. When they, they hit all the Daubert standards and the 702 standards, because it does make your your prep of direct and cross examination a lot simpler. That was probably the most fun I've had in that case. Yeah. The guy from Miami, he, Paul, asked the question, "Well, what what is the River District?" And the guy sat there, deer deer in the headlights. It felt like five minutes, but I know it was only thirty seconds. And he, he the River District is near the river. <laughs> he answered me answered truthfully. He did. He did. Um, I'll move us through quickly here. Who, who's heard of USPAP? We've talked about that briefly. Okay. So we're talking about the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Okay. This is akin to GAP for accountants. All right. What I want you to realize, though, when you're dealing with appraisers, we've really got, from a regulatory standpoint, an industry that's still in its infancy. Okay. This was a role that was filled essentially by real estate experts or brokers or agents in the past. The uniform standards weren't even written until 1987, okay? And they weren't adopted until 1989. And just in the 11, 12 years I've been in, in the industry, the book has expanded two or three times, okay? So we're talking about something that's really still in its infancy. And so when you're dealing with appraisers, you need to realize this is an evolving, an evolving industry. Um, Important for you to know, USPAP is the standard of practice in Florida. There is no opting out to alternative standards for a real estate appraiser in Florida, okay? The, the one exception you can run into is if you have an appraiser, for example, I've got a broker's license, okay? So if you've got someone who has dual licenses, what role are they filling? What are they doing? Am I offering my opinion as a broker or as an appraiser? Now, the uniform standards do require that I make that clear. So there, there is still a protection in there, but that's the only differentiation you could run into. But otherwise, there's no opting out of those standards. That comes from uh, Chapter 475 of the Florida Statute, which defers to the Florida Real Estate Appraisal Board to write the rules. 
If you go to the actual rules for standards of practice, it is literally C use path. That's basically what it is. And the reason I point that out is that other states are different, okay? But, you, uh, but Florida adopts, on the whole, in its entirety, the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice. Um, why does this matter? Because you can't let appraisers get away with violating it. And I'm talking mainly, mainly in that sense for opposing appraisers, okay? The biggest area, and I think the biggest blind spot that I see in litigation that people get away with is rebutting the other appraiser on the other side of the aisle. You need to realize, both when you put your appraiser in this position and if the other side's appraiser is, is trying to impugn your appraisal, that appraiser is engaging in standard three of the uniform standards, okay? It seems innocent enough to say, well, you know, here's what they screwed up and here's what they did and here's what I did. That seems simple enough and, and in practice that's what happens all the time. What is standard three? Standard three in, in uh, use path is what deals with appraisal review, both the development of review and reporting. So if you want your expert witness to be able to rebut the opposing side, you better cut them loose to develop a standard three compliant review. Now that can be something as simple as a signed certification with the notes that form the basis of the review. It doesn't have to be a separate written report, but I would have it. I can just go ahead and tell you right now, every attorney I work with, I, I, I try to point that out so that we can, if possible, if the other side gets up on the stand and starts going on and on about my report, you know, hey, have you done you know, a review, can I see, you know, your certification for that? Is this, is what you're offering, because what you're offering as an appraisal review is a standard three compliant. It never is. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. How does that work if, for example, you're asked to um, comment on why you did not use a particular comparable sale that the other appraiser used? Yeah. Does that level three review apply to that? It doesn't. Can you just pick apart the other comps. Yeah, that, that, in my opinion, we fall into the tricky area of you're effectively asking me about my scope of work and my uh, research. So I'm, I'm always comfortable enough answering that still in my lane. Where you will say, I reviewed that, I, I uh, reviewed that comparable sale and I decided it was not appropriate because that's, of yes. this problem. And, that's, and that's, that's a question I feel comfortable answering staying even within my lane. Yep. So that's why it's important. It's not about, you know, hey, I want you to know about our standards of practice. It's about, you better know for your practice. Um, so really you can handle that on direct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you, this is the biggest blind spot I see. It's never dealt with. And yet I, I, I think that's an area where I always try to encourage the attorneys to go after. Um, creating a scope of work that's consistent with the intended use, that's something that sometimes runs into play, particularly when access to a property isn't available. Uh, is the scope of work sufficient for the work that's being done? Is it not? You just need to make sure that um, you're allowing your appraiser to develop credible assignment results. Um, I'll move quickly here to potential changes to use path. I just want to summarize these because these wouldn't be coming until 2016, 2017, but all three of the major proposed changes deal with the litigation side of the practice, okay? So you guys are really starting to get folded into what are we doing when we're doing litigation related work. Um, record keeping rules changes. Interim drafts and report communications must be retained in a work file until they are superseded by a new report or communication. That's something that's being talk talked about out there. Um, a draft, okay, uh, which, is a, which is something that's not even defined right now in USPAT, but that's also being dealt with. So draft reports, do I have to keep them, do I not? Okay, use PAP starting to, to dance into that. And all three of these interrelate. Defining a report, um, a proposed change would define that a report is a completed agreement with a signed certification. Again, we're trying to differentiate between draft, work product, and final written reports. And then final draft reports or interim communications. Again, being addressed for the first time in the record keeping rule, differentiating a draft of an interim report from a completed report, and they also must be uh, prominently identified as draft work product and not include a signed certification. There's also language that suggests that there needs to be specific language that says it's subject to change until it's a signed certification. So I wanted to touch on those because that's really starting to get folded into your side of, reacting, of uh, interacting with appraisers. So tips and strategies quickly here, we're at the end. Work with an appraiser who knows use path. That, that's, that's basically the gist of the overarching theme here, okay? And, more, and, and oftentimes as important, 
who hasn't violated it, okay? That's obviously the last thing you want to do is get somebody up there, and, and I've, I've been there before where we're just waiting because we know what we're dealing with on the other side, and they're looking forward to the trial for that, okay? Uh, so you want to avoid that. That's easy to find out, obviously, at the state level. Um, and your appraiser and knowing use PAP, not only should they not violate use PAP, but they shouldn't let opposing counsel's appraiser get away with it either. You should, be, you should be retaining an appraiser that understands how to digest the other side's work and inform you and help you strategically plan for cross. And we've covered that already. So to me, that, that kind of runs into a question that can be rhetorical, but I'm, I'm certainly open. Uh, I'd like to hear people's thoughts. How would you use Dogger? Okay. So if you've got, if you're, if you're made aware of something that you think is um, not up to snuff with Daubert, do you, you address that at a, I suppose, a pretrial evidentiary hearing? Do you bring that up then, or do you, you hold that close to the vest and wait for trial? It's my question to you. I don't know. Maybe that you know depends on the case. Maybe it depends on what it is. But that to me is always something that's interesting that we get into. You know, how do you how do you approach it, and when do you approach it? Uh, be careful to watch uh, for USPAP standard three. We covered that um, already. Communicate up front uh, with the appraiser. Communicate the intended use, the scope of work, and Mike touched on earlier phased engagements, which is kind of new. It's uh, something most appraisers don't think about. It, they usually think in terms of all or nothing. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can set up a phased engagement that's appropriate and, and far more palatable from a cost standpoint to your client. Um, so here's a question we've kind of had, and I'll, I'll admit I don't know the answer. Um, when you're dealing with, see you didn't realize we brought you here to pick your brains today. When you're dealing with trying to determine contested matters versus uh, adversary proceedings, okay? When Rule 26 applies, because my understanding is, and, and again here I'm explaining to a surgeon how to do surgery, so I realize I'm threading on thin ice, but What's discoverable for drafts? As I understand that Rule 26 deals with what's discoverable, and that in contested matters, drafts are discoverable, but if an adversary proceeding comes out of uh, a bankruptcy case, it's not. Again, I may, may have misspoken, but what I've read, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting conversation. Is the, draft, is the draft work discoverable or is it not? Obviously pretty important, I can assure you, I want to know up front, you know, what, what's able to be retrieved and what isn't. Um, litigation support specialists. This is something that we mentioned, you know, how USPAP is growing exponentially. This has become a little niche industry within appraisal practice. We've got people all over the country um, who are marketing themselves as USPAP experts, and they just do litigation-related work. They consult with attorneys, and uh, they do it nationwide. Um, and they make it their focus to essentially serve in this role that we've talked about. Um, and obviously, you can see the value of that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, again, how you would handle it on your end, but it's pretty, pretty advantageous to be able to have someone who can, without question, get up, pick apart the opposer, opposing side's appraisal and essentially have to leave them in this Perry Mason moment of, well, is your appraisal use pack compliant or is it not? with no other way to answer other than no, even if they, even if they you know, have only violated you know, in certain areas. And I can tell you, most appraisals, particularly the ones that I see out there, are not, not just the ones that come for disciplinary hearings, they can be picked apart. To me, from the standpoint of establishing credibility, I think that goes untapped so often. There's unchallenged opinions, unchallenged reports, when there shouldn't be, because there's a lot of meat on the bones that you can go after if you work with somebody who knows the uniform standards. And then finally, I just wanted to mention uh, opinion-based experts in the age of big data. Big data is obviously something that's talked about, not just in the appraisal industry, although it's big for us. Um, but we live in an information age, okay? Uh, Mike talked about you know, how information used to be proprietary. You, you guarded it. Frankly, there's no benefit in even doing that anymore. Information is a dime a dozen. The ability to analyze it and to communicate what it means is not. And um, where I said before that people delving into standard three review, just opining off the cuff uh, about someone else's work without having done a standard three review is the biggest 
blind spot and I think the biggest opportunity for you all. I think the next big step coming is folks who understand in an information age how to disseminate and analyze data to the point that if you put me up on the stand and I have an adjustment in a report, you know, I may, I may speak well, I may be articulate, but frankly, whether or not I am or not, I can prove to you the support because I've got the data to support it. That was in the details. Yeah. Submarket analysis or a particular property analysis where you found something that the other people didn't find because your analytical skills are different. That's where the, the dip, that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And, and frankly, if you're not doing that now too, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're treading on thin ice right. to, to, to do that. The data is out there. Uh, opinions still matter, but the opinions have to be based, obviously, with, with support behind them. And obviously, that's part of how Dalbert fall, falls into all of this, too. So that's um, essentially the tips and strategies we had. Sorry, I, I rushed it a little bit at the end. But obviously, any questions anyone has, uh, any information you'd like, we do have a newsletter sign up up here if anyone would, would like to sign up. One email a month, we, we send out simply market update information that we think is pretty valuable. Um, and it's obviously a way for us to stay all in touch with you. We'd love for anyone to sign up. But any other questions, comments, thoughts, we'd be happy to answer and we'll be here after a few minutes. So thanks so much for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. That was great. Um, Sealy forms. So I'll put them on the desk here. Um, Judge Delana, would you like to address the membership? Well, thanks, Paul. I just have a couple of things. I want to thank you for that program. It was just great. And I will say, in, in my experience on the bench, and usually we're dealing with residential uh, properties, single-family residences, um, but usually what's most attackable is the, um, is, are the comps on either end of the spectrum, the ones that are really low and the ones that are really high. Usually, you know, your appraiser can help you uh, take a look at the other appraiser's comps and, and, and help you with that. Uh, I have just a couple of announcements that I wanted to um, bring to your attention today. One is there's a couple of changes in the bankruptcy rules that go effect December 1st. Uh, the big one uh, is that the time for serving a summons and complaint is being shortened from 14 days to 7 days. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. There's a couple of fee changes. I don't think they really affect most people. If there's a direct appeal to the 11th Circuit, the fee is increased. And I think uh, they're going after those credit card companies that file proofs of claim with a lot of confidential information because now if there's a motion to redact confidential information, there's a $25 per case charge. So that seems to me to be uh, kind of an interesting kind of an interesting development. There's a couple of uh, major administrative orders that are about to come down the pipe. Uh, one is a addressing reaffirmation procedures. These will be uh, district-wide procedures, so any division uh, they'll be applicable to. And I don't think there's anything really earth-shattering, but just will put everybody on notice as to what the standards are with respect to reaffirmation agreements. Another one with respect to adversary proceedings in terms of how they are processed by the court and what you all can expect. And again, that will be uh, district-wide. And then there is a new administrative order that's about to come out. I think the Judge Gentleman is going to sign it today. And it's about using um, exhibits in an electronically stored format rather than paper exhibits. So um, this is something when you get the rule or the administrative order, you're going to want to take a look at it. We are really looking for feedback on this. And this is why it's being rolled out in the form of an administrative order rather than as a local rule, because we want to see how it's working for practitioners. But essentially what the, rule, what the administrative order provides is that parties are to meet and confer, decide if they're going to exchange exhibits in paper format or electronic format. If they decide to go with the electronic format, uh, then instead of uh, bringing binders of exhibits to the court, what they can do is they can bring the exhibits to the court either on a flash drive or on a CD. And uh, they'll have to bring some paper copies for the judge and for the witnesses. But uh, essentially, they can do that electronically, and that'll assist our courtroom uh, deputies and case managers when they have to upload the record on appeal because we'll already have it in an electronic format. If you have less than 25 exhibits, you can just file them on the docket. You can do a notice of filing with uh, links to your exhibits, and that will be deemed the exchange of exhibits for um, purposes of the uh, pretrial order. 
And uh, if you have more than 25, then of course you use the flash drive or you use a CD. So just kind of see how that will work with your practice. A lot of times, not so much in the smaller cases, but in the bigger cases, you know, we'll have uh, attorneys, they'll, they'll uh, list, oh, let's say 200 exhibits on their um, exhibit list, but they only actually use about 20 at trial. And that would mean you'd only have to bring the paper copies for the 20 that you actually intended to use. So that'll be an interesting administrative order as we see how it plays out in practice. But hopefully it'll save you all uh, some paper and some time and some money as well as the court. So as always, I'm always happy to take any questions if anyone has any questions about what's going on uh, here in Fort Myers. No? Well, that's great. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for a great program. Judge Gentleman is coming in January. Oh, Judge Gentleman is coming in January, State of the District Address, which I believe will be at our um, program, correct? Yes. And no December meeting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't miss that part. All right, no December meeting. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I am here in December. Good a job. Bit. Have a good day. My schedule's speeded, I've forgotten. <laughs>